This is Ryan Abraham, Chris Trevino, uscfootball.com. Instant analysis inside Jerry World, Jerry's World, uh, USC's unbelievable 46-45 loss. Uh, the Tulane Green Wave here in the 87th Cotton Bowl. Chris, this is a yet another game where the Trojans controlled the game pretty much to the beginning. Did not have, uh, was not down in the game until the final minute. In this case, the final 10 seconds of the game with Tulane scoring that late touchdown. Um, what's the initial thoughts coming out of this one? A night where the offense was really, really good and USC's defense and special teams were very, very bad. Yeah, I'm not quite sure where to start before we even hit the record on this button. We're like, where do we start? Is it the defense? <laughs> Is it special teams? Is it Alex Grinch? Is it, you know, the offense, you know, having that miscue at the end with the safety? I don't know. There's so many things to talk about, but it all really comes back to USC not finishing and just an absolute collapse of this team in the fourth quarter and we this is completes what I would say is a trifecta of tough losses for USC you know in Utah you had the lead for most of the game and then you let it get away right at the very end you got blown out by Utah straight up in the fourth quarter at the Pac-12 championship you know that game didn't look it didn't look close at the end with you know Caleb Williams injured and then here today tonight here at the the Cotton Bowl and AT&T Stadium you had the lead it looks like you were in control you know they had that 14 point lead with about five minutes four four minutes and 30 seconds left and you just could not finish and probably the most brutal one of all just to see it melt away like that and slip away and you know guys were searching for answers after that you know specifically defensive players and we'll get into that but just a stunning loss to Tulane in here in the Cotton Bowl where it looked like they were in control and I believe I saw it on Twitter they had like a 99.8 percent uh, win percentage in this one before you know and hats off to Tulane you know they did you know as Lincoln Riley pointed out they kept swinging they kept fighting and they were able to come back in the end and you know pull off this um, miraculous stunner and agonizing defeat for USC as it goes into the offseason with two consecutive losses and two big games for sure and Lincoln Riley after the game uh, spoke to the media we didn't get to talk to him very much they kept it was very controlled we weren't allowed to film it so they limited the questions that we were able to get in but he did talk about this team failing in all three phases and you even mentioned the safety I mean, to me this wasn't an offensive failure at all Caleb Williams did have the one uh, bad turnover one interception he's allowed to make one mistake I was talking about it he was teary-eyed after the game but they never punted they never turned the ball over uh, on downs and the one safety is when a bad special team play set them up on the one so not, I mean on the offense you had a guy like Brendan Rice going six catches, 134 yards, two touchdowns. Just It was a highlight reel for him. Taj Washington goes over 100 yards. And Caleb Williams, despite having a bunch of drops where he could have had probably over 500 yards passing, still at 462 or whatever it was, uh, he had a monster to, to follow up the Heisman with that. I don't put any of this on the offense. It can't be perfect. And they were pretty close to it today. Yeah, I mean, I think you just say that to kind of be like, ah, you don't want to, you know, <laughs> jump on special teams and defense for, for their part in the collapse. But technically, it was the offense that gave up the safety, you know, and it wasn't, it, it was in a bad position put there by, you know, Mario Williams, you know, fumbling the ball out of the one yard line. Just a terrible, terrible mistake in miscue. And, you know, we've seen this on special teams all season and it reared its head here late in this game when things were slipping away. Just to have that on top of everything that was going on was just, uh, so brutal so brutal and just kept stacking and stacking and stacking and then to have the safety you know they're in a, just a difficult spot because they are without their all-american guard you know they're out with their their stalwart center and brett nealon just needed a really good job filling in there but something went on with that play where there was some disconnect and they got out physical then just needed said afterwards you know that safety is sitting in his gut right now because you know he put the blame on him and that offensive line you know they had to be more physical and they weren't against that Tulane defensive front and, you know, that just added to the snowball effect of everything that was going wrong. So, yeah, but overall, you can't really put it on the offense. That was more so on the special teams, I would say, just because just put them in a really bad spot with you knowing that their offensive line is sort of a makeshift group. And it's just a tough play call in that situation because you can't really throw the ball out of your own end zone. Even though USC's passing attack was really good, you just don't want to risk it in that situation. So just in a tough spot overall, but... I would put that more on special teams than offense. Yeah, I think mean, the offense was not fine. They were completely good. I mean, it was a good offensive performance, but it's kind of been that way through a lot of the season. Uh, and, you know, twice for Caleb Williams, a team scores in the last minute of the game and just not giving him enough opportunity, enough time on the clock to finish the ball with the way he did, like you saw against Oregon State. You mentioned special teams. 
I got to look. It was two or three drives, like starting with inside your own five-yard line. I mean, multiple drives where you don't return the kickoff or you get a penalty on the kickoff or both. Um, you know, shouldn't be returning the kickoff. Even the last play, you know, the last drive of the game, you start at the 11 instead of the 25, trying to score with only nine seconds left. So just so a lot of mistakes like that. Nothing bigger than Mario Williams catching the ball and fumbling out of bounds at the one. There's no special teams coordinator. We've seen USC special teams and other special teams be bad with a coordinator. But I think in general, like my philosophy all the season has been don't return kickoffs. I don't see any reason why you would want to change that. And Lincoln Riley talked about after the game, like trying to make, you know, you're trying to make decisions for the future. He was mostly talking about the defense, which we'll get to in a second. But they're going to look at this over the next couple of weeks and kind of make assessments of what you're going to do big picture. But one of the big picture items has to be fixing the special teams unit that's just been putting the, the Trojans in a bad spot all night. 52-yard missed field goal, fine. But the, the, the returns and the lack of returns and starting in really terrible field position time after time in crucial situations, I think it's gonna. it can haunt you, and it did tonight. Yeah, that felt something they were playing with fire all season, and we've seen it cost them a couple times. And then it really reared its head, like I said, here t- today at the Cotton Bowl. And, yeah, that's something that, you know, I'm sure that's on Lincoln Riley's checkboard list to reevaluate and, and do a deep dive on in the offseason. It's going to be a long offseason, so he's going to have time to look at it, maybe tinker with his philosophy of not having a special teams coordinator. So we'll see what that kind of looks like moving forward. But, yes, special teams – was sort of the second culprit here to a even bigger issue, which was the defense. Oh, you want to mention the defense? Yes. Oh, I think uh, we have to. <laughs> uh, we did. So what was available afterwards, Makai Blackman, who I thought played well, one of the few Trojans that didn't uh, miss a bunch of tackles. He forced a fumble, recovered it himself. That was a big play. We got to talk to him at the podium a little bit, so he talked a little while. And then after the game, Nick Figueroa, who you got to talk to, and Shane Lee, defensive lineman and linebacker, respectively, I got to talk to him. And both of them talked about, you know, finishing. And Lincoln Riley mentioned after the game that tackling was an issue. I tried to ask Shane Lee about that. It's just one of those things you got to finish. And um, they weren't doing that. And we saw plays that looked like they would get blown up at the line of scrimmage. Tajay Spears, 17 carries, over 200 yards for, for Tulane. You can't let something like that happen. But tackling was a continued problem but huge plays was a big problem when you have Michael Pratt the the Tulane quarterback he only completed eight passes but for over 230 yards averaging 30 yards a completion and there wasn't it wasn't just that USC was missing tackles you weren't getting stops you weren't putting up any resistance and that's a problem you couldn't even slow it. it wasn't even like you were giving up scores you were giving up very quickly and that's been a problem all year long it almost felt like a a bit, Ryan, like a running joke <laughs> for this game where, you know, USC or Tulane would start the ball deep in their own end zone or from the 25 or the 30, whatever, and then literally two plays and they'd be down in the red zone. Like that happened at least four times off the top of my head. I remember one, I went to tie my shoe and USC and, and Tulane was already in the end zone. And I was like, what happened? And that's how fast it was happening. And it was just bam, bam, bam. And USC's defense just looked like they were reeling most of the time early in Tulane's drives. They didn't know what to do. Uh, Tajay Spears would have a big player or Pratt would complete one of his eight, eight, eight throws down the field and it just spiraled from there. And, uh, you know, I was on the sideline for this game t- taking photos and it just seemed like there was no confidence on that defensive side. You know, that confidence has just been chipped away all season. You know, they've heard, you know, fans calling for Alex Grinch. They've heard, you know, these calls on social media and everything. And I think it's just been eating away at them, eating away at them. And I know they, they talked about how they felt really good about the bowl practices they were having especially on the defensive side of the ball. And Nick Figueroa was asked, you know, where was the disconnect between what you guys were saying about how you were practicing leading up to this and the month you had to prepare? And he just, he just didn't really have an answer. You know, he, he didn't really have an answer for, for that. And, you know, I give respect to him for, you know, a- answering some tough questions in front of the media uh, in his final media interview as a Trojan. But they were just at, seemed to be at a loss and they didn't really know what happened. And, you know, he kind of said that he felt that Some of the guys kind of lost their edge to be the guy to go out there and make the play. And I think you could see some of that, you know, with the confidence issues, as I mentioned. And that was kind of his assessment that, you know, players had lost a little bit of their edge over the course of the last several months of the season. Yeah, Shane Lee talked about playing loose and free, but this is stuff that, like, maybe you hear beginning in the season. This is at the end. You mentioned, you know, you had... You had a few weeks to kind of get ready. It sounded like they were working on things. When you when you know what the problem is and you've apparently tried to fix it for the last few weeks, I don't think you maybe assessed really enough, like where the you – know, either you can't fix the problem or you didn't really assess it in the right way. And Lincoln Riley was asked about uh, – you know, the, we didn't get a lot of questions, like you said, but was asked about 
the defensive philosophy, like where you go going forward. And he said, you know, 15 minutes after a tough loss, it's hard to go big picture uh, right now. But over the next few weeks, they're going to do a deep dive and look at everything. And that's a significantly, it wasn't a vote of confidence uh, for Alex Grinch, the defensive coordinator, for sure. And I think after the Pac-12 championship game, he talked about players being in the right position and not making the tackle. And to me, reading between the lines, that was, we got to get better players. Hearing what he said today, there wasn't any kind of praise for what the scheme was, what the position was. So I don't know. I mean, it would be hard to picture him making a switch at defensive coordinator after one year. They've Everyone talked about all the improvement you've made from, you know, from 4-8 and eight to 11. It's a huge improvement. And he, he hinted at, you know, making a bigger improvement next year. But at this, the, it wasn't a vote of confidence, I guess you would say, from what Riley said, reading between the lines with what they're going to do defensively going forward. And I just want to clarify that question was asked, what is your confidence in Alex Grinch? That was a specific question. And he said, like you said, you know, we just played the game 15 minutes ago. I'm not getting into big picture stuff. We'll deep dive into that. We'll make a plan like we've always done since we got to California. So long off season, but the Alex Grinch question, I hope you're ready for it, Ryan. Every podcast we do for the next uh, several months will be, when will Alex Grinch get fired? Are they going to fire Alex Grinch? That is going to be the number one topic for us. And look, I'm not going to sit here and be like, They need to fire Alex Grinch. I'm never going to be a reporter that's going to call for someone's head in that situation. So you guys are the ones that are going to be doing that all the time, all the time on their comments. But I think think it was with you where I said you asked, does Alex Grinch get fired off the Cotton Bowl or something like we had a question. I said, not unless they give up 9 million points or something like that. And this felt like 9 million points, especially (laughs) when you have that that two-touchdown lead. And to give it up like that kind of felt similar. Now, I'm not saying they're going to fire him, but I think if you're Lincoln Riley, you do have to – sit down and take a long hard look at it and you know based off his answer that's what they're going to do do i think he's going to get fired right now no i don't think so but this is the closest you've ever felt for it in the season you know just coming off two really bad performances in that pac-12 championship and then here today in the cotton bowl just give giving it up like you did so brutal just a brutal way to end the season and that's what's going to be on your minds for the next you know six months you're gonna have to think about that you're gonna have to stew in that you have to sit in it for that time and, and, and really watch that tape over and over. But that's the big question. That's going to be the splinter in the side of USC fans. Uh, fandom for the next several months and for us as we answer those questions. But, you know, that's something Lincoln Riley has to, to address. He's the head man. He's the head leader of this program. It's his decision in the end. And maybe he has to make that tough decision. But it's certainly something he's going to have to look at moving forward. For sure. And if you look at, you know, you're going to watch the tape. And uh, USC put up a lot of yards. And Willie Fritz, we were listening to him a little bit afterwards, the Tulane head coach, and talking about, hey, needed to get a stop. But you felt like Tulane was tackling well. You could look at, man, it's just a, the other team was just making big plays. On the USC side, the defensive side, there wasn't any resistance whatsoever. It was just hot knife through butter. And when you see that over and over again, it looks like routes on air, not like you're actually playing a game. There's That's going to sit in your craw. That's going to be something Lincoln Riley is going to have to assess afterwards. And there's there's just no question about it because it wasn't like this. you were this close, you know, that they were, you were making a play here and making a play there. And for just like the Utah game earlier in the season, in the uh, in middle of the season at Salt Lake City, the, the percentage that you mentioned, like USC winning percentage was very high. Well, all that means is, for USC to lose the game, a series of events that would not go USC's way would have to occur in a row, and that's what happened here. That's like saying, you know, flip a coin five times in a row, and it's got to be heads every time. It's not likely, but it can happen, and that's literally what happened. If you have a 15-point lead with 4.30 left on the clock, and Tulane had already used two of their timeouts, so that was, you know, Willie Fritz was calling timeouts when USC got into a second and long situation with over five minutes left in the game. So the, he was playing that long game, but even calling those timeouts and saving the clock the way he did, a whole bunch of things had to go wrong for USC or right for Tulane. That kickoff return to the one that caused the safety was that one thing and it allowed Tulane to get out of here with a one-point win. But a series of events in two games this year, you know, bad events at the end of the game. But if you're USC, all you got to do is make one of those plays. And I think that's probably what's going to be the hardest for Lincoln Riley, knowing that they screwed up so much on special teams and the defensive side late in games and lost those games. Yeah, if you score down there instead of taking the field goal, this game's probably over. I was thinking in the back of my head, you know, USC's moving the ball. You score here. This one's pretty much done, knowing that Tulane has burned a lot of their timeouts. They're going to have to throw the ball. Maybe, uh, you know, USC's defensive front can make some sacks, which they did at the end on that final drive. But 
you know, maybe they got a little bit too conservative there in the end in the red zone when they were calling some runs, maybe to shave off some time of that clock. I thought they were being a little bit too conservative because Tulane's secondary had proven that they couldn't stop any of USC's receivers. You know, shout out to Brendan Rice, had a monster game with six receptions, 174 yards, and two touchdowns, looking like his dad out here uh, over the star. And they go for the runs. And outside of Relique Brown, the running game was just really ineffective. Yeah. Austin Jones averaged, uh, I believe, 2.8 yards per carry. Uh, and Relique was the only one in there. So it was just a weird decision. You know, we've seen some of those conservative play callings sometimes uh, throughout, the, throughout the season. And that one there really bit them. You know, you felt good about at least getting three points. But you put in a touchdown there, this game is over. And, you know, I think they could have been a little bit more aggressive there in that situation. For sure. And this is another one of those situations where the Pac-12 championship game loser is, I think, 0-11 now in the in the bowl game. And this was certainly a winnable game. Uh, very, you know, looking with two touchdown leads multiple times, especially with, you know, just a few minutes left in the game. It's hard to, I think, you know, just talking to the players afterwards, talking to some of the staff members that were walking off the field. Lincoln Riley actually walked by us uh, when we were doing a little bit earlier. But I, this is one of those things, and I know USC fans are not going to be happy about it, but it's going to sit for it's going to be hard I think it's going to make the offseason a little bit different I mean there's things you can be proud of and Lincoln Riley talked about that the cha- you know what they made he was they think he thinks the team is ahead of where of schedule in a lot of areas but knowing how close they were a couple of plays away from he said who knows where because you make one of those plays and you're in the college football playoff and who knows what happens with there so I think he was had some positivity that they are close but knowing that they were just Gut wrenching. He said this was one of the toughest losses he can remember in his career. Which, I mean, it's, it's from what games I've covered. I don't know losing a game like this at the end. I, I haven't seen much of that. Just absolutely brutal. And we've mentioned it several times. This is going to be a sucky off season for USC fans. <laughs> but think about it. You have these two gnawing losses that are going to be in the back of your head for the next several months. You know, that's something that can lead to a great turn, not a turnaround, but a even greater motivation going into next season. So, and you hope. You know, this is all for not all for not, and they're able to use these two losses to fuel them for next season into, you know, that Pac-12 championship, college football playoff. You know, we've seen multiple players at the Pac-12 championship stay on the field to watch Utah celebrate. We saw multiple players here tonight stay on the field to watch Tulane celebrate being Cotton Bowl champions. That's something you use in the offseason, something they're going to use in the offseason. You just hope that it is team-wide and something good comes out of it for next season, just taking these losses and translating it into something good, whether that's better tackling next season, better defense, all that all that kind of stuff. It's a major bowl, New Year's Six Bowl. You have the Heisman Trophy winner on your team. You win 11 games after winning over four last year. There's a lot of positives to take away from this. It's been We've been down here for the last several days. Uh, the Cotton Bowl does it right. They make it feel like it's a national championship game. I think the players, for the people who question their motivation, I don't think that was an issue at all. I feel like they wanted to win this game. That was brought up multiple times, you know, but it's a tough loss for sure. It's one that, you know, it's going to take a while for to, to get over this one. But it was, I think, you're doing, you're, you're trying to accomplish what you need to accomplish if you're turning around a team and you want to aspire to win championships. I think they're on their way. They got some, some big things they got to fix. Any final thoughts on that or just the game? Anything else here from our time in Arlington? Uh, one quick positive note, Rajon Davis. I think yeah. that I just want to do, in a, in a game full of ugly moments and bad things, I did want to shout out one bright spot. And I think that was Rajon Davis, who I don't want that to be lost in the loss. And I talked to Nick Figueroa about it, but he said he's really excited for Rajon Davis and what he was able to do today. And, you know, USC fans feel vindicated, I assume, because they've been calling for number nine all season, especially with a linebacker core that has looked slow at times, has looked un- unathletic at times, and a little bit too slow for some of these faster uh, backs that they faced. Tejon Spears, you know, showed that t- today. But Rajon Davis, fastest linebacker on the team, came in and made some really good plays. You know, he was involved with that fumble recovery, made a really big sta- uh, tackle. He was also on special teams. He was doing it all, and he seemed to be getting a lot more more playing time in the rotation and even played in some crunch time here late in the fourth so you're hoping that this is a good springboard for number nine a guy who really upgrades the athleticism of that backer unit and I think he had a really good performance you know I have to go back and watch the tape a little bit more but just for him being thrown in there in a big moment in a big game in AT&T Stadium and NFL Stadium and playing like he did I think that's a really good sign for for the future and his his future play for sure and Shane Lee was asked about him as well and He basically came in and replaced Shane Lee at times in those drives. And all positives uh, out of Shane Lee. Really excited for what he can do. They know how athletic he is and how he can help 
this defense. But it's good. We can end on a positive note there here. And a, a very disappointing 46-45 loss. I don't know if I've seen anything like this before. It's been uh, kind of crazy. Oh, you got something? I was just say, do you think if you had won the uh, cornhole tournament <laughs> yesterday, we, it would have been a different different thing? It was a one-point one loss yeah, in one the Media loss. Olympics cornhole. It was a one-point loss in at and that I did win a cooler, though, so I don't think you get a consolation uh, second place cotton ball trophy which is a pretty big trophy kind of cool looking one too but all right well we're going to wrap it up here uh arlington texas at&t stadium i've been here three times trojans lost them all this one was a lot closer it looked like they were going to win this one where the other two not so much but for chris trevino i'm ryan abraham hope you guys enjoyed all the coverage here for the the uh, 2022 college football season it's been a lot of fun a lot more positivity with the way the team's been playing so that's happy we appreciate all that appreciate all you fans tuning in reading our stuff over at uscfootball.com hope you enjoyed it and we will talk to you next time